You know, the uh, parshas that we read, of course, are always connected to Hanukkah in terms of the time of the year. The parshas of Ayesha, parshas of Gates, they hit during this time, and the obvious question that people wonder about, and again, it sort of gives the, the rabbis a lot of license to sort of maneuver in any direction they'd like in terms of connecting the story of Yosef to Hanukkah. Hanukkah is right around the corner. So what's the connection? So you could probably give a, a hundred answers, if not more, and I would love for you to bring it up to the shopping table because it's certainly something to wonder about. Certainly the story of Yosef, the brothers, the sale, Yaakov's feelings, Yaakov's angst about this whole situation. You can probably find a lot of imaginative ways to connect it to the story of Hanukkah. But I just want to share with you one Rashi at the beginning of the part that I think gives us an incredibly direct connection. A direct connection to what Hanukkah and the story of Yosef and these parshas represent. And Rashi talks about Vayeshev Yaakov. Yaakov wanted to live in a sort of another, a whole other discussion what that really means. He wanted to have Benucha. He wanted to live the Shalva. Yaakov went through so much already. And here he was in a moment in time when he thought maybe I could sort of take a deep breath and relax. And all my trials and tribulations from, from Esau and from from Shem and Dina and that whole story, and then you, know, you had Lovin, of course, and all the trials and tribulations of Lovin. And Rashi tells us that really he didn't really, he couldn't relax. In fact, that this particular parasha, especially as it follows by Yishlach, really brought up a whole new concern for Yaakov Avinu. And Rashi said that Yaakov was super concerned because at the very end of Yishlach, what do we read about? We read about the Aluf Ayesu. These incredible, powerful troops and armies of Esau. And how he created an incredible nation of, of unimaginable power. And of course, this was Edom, this was Rome, this was ultimately evolved into one of the most difficult nations that has really so much devastated Jewish history throughout these last 2,000 years. So Rashi says that amazingly, while Yaakov certainly knew about the, the promises that Hashem made to him, he certainly knew that he, he didn't have to worry based on anything internal because Akash Baruch runs the world. He knew that Akash Baruch could manage Esau. But despite all that, he saw the numbers, he saw the power, and he was, he was frightened. And he was overwhelmed. He didn't know what to do. Certainly you can relate to the fact that this was the Feelings of Christ all during the time of Hanukkah when the incredibly powerful Greek army so dominated the Jewish people and so limited their ability to, to uh, practice the Yiddish fact. And it would be very easy if you put yourself in that place in that time to say, how in the world can we van vanquish an enemy like the Greeks? How is it possible? Can't happen. A Rashi right here in the beginning of the nation tells us but there's a marshal, there's a parable to this situation. So what are you, what are you worried about, Yaakov? You're concerned? You don't think you can vanquish your enemy of such incredible magnitude? You think you're, you're overwhelmed with the numbers and the sheer power of Asa's armies are going to knock you out? Do you really believe that? The marshal is a marshal to a guy working in a, in, a, in a metal place. He's a blacksmith and he's banging on metal. He's got the hammer, he's got the anvil, and he's doing his work. He doesn't have a lot of room, but all of a sudden, Rashi brings that bunch of candles coming with flax all the way piled up to the ceiling. Tons of flax. And the guy's working on, with a, on his anvil, he's working with his hammer, all of a sudden, what are you bringing me? What are you doing here? I have no room. This is not a big enough place. And he sees flax piled up, all this, all this uh, material piled up to the ceiling. He says, what are you doing here? How am, I going to, how am I going to deal with this? I don't have the room for this. This is too much. I can't manage. And a wise man tells him, what? You can't manage? You all worried about what you're going to do with all this flax and that, you know, that, that it doesn't belong here? You don't know how you're going to get rid of it and, get, and, and be able to destroy it? You know who you are and you know what you are? What's your job? What do you do? What are you doing right now? He says, you're a blacksmith. You've got a hammer. 
You've got an anvil. What happens when you bang the, the hammer on the anvil? It makes a spark. We well know in, in California what, what, you, what a spark can do. You have a spark. Without one spark, you know what you can do to all that flax? It literally, in, in a matter of seconds, and minutes, the flax will be gone. So you worry. You don't know how to manage. You don't know how you're going to be able to deal with, with this challenge of the, the numerical su superiority of Asa. The power, the, the military might of an Asa. You don't know how to, how to manage. You don't know how you can de defeat the enemy. You know what you have? Just like that spark can vanquish and destroy tons and tons of flax in a matter of seconds. We see one little spark of a cigarette can cause a show and half of California is burning. We see it unfortunately way too many times. So we know, we, we can literally visualize that power of fire. The power of Yosef. Rashi says, Yaakov, you know, Yaakov, you says, Yaakov, you worry. You don't know how you, you're going to beat the enemies. You don't know how you're going to beat Rome and Esau and Greek, Greeks and, and, and all the other enemies you face down the line. You don't know how you're going to over, be able to overcome them. Do you know what you have? You have Yosef. You have the power of Torah. You have that fire, which is Yosef. And Esau, ultimately, with all of his incredible power, with all of his military, and all of his hatred, whatever he has coming at you, you can vanquish it as easily as a little spark and destroy flax. A one match can burn down a hundreds of thousands of acres. One little match. You say, how? The devastation. You see the, the horror. You see the devastation of families losing. Who knows? You know, we see what it can do. These are, like the Chavetz Chaim says, every time when we live in a world where the visualization gets clearer, it's for us to be able to visualize better. The power of not, unfortunately, real fire, which we see in a tragic way, but the pure, the spiritual, the spiritual fire, the fire of Torah, the fire of Yosef, the fire that says, if you go with Torah, if you go with truth, if you go with purity, and you will hold on to what you know to be true, what you know to have in your hand, you know what you can do? You can't vanquish an enemy. You can't beat the Greeks. You can't beat the, the Romans. There's nobody who can stand up to you. There's nobody who can hold a, a candle to you. Because you have Torah. You have Yosef. And Yosef is that lahava that literally destroys and consumes the kash, which is Esau. It's straw. It looks so powerful, and yet we can see. If we needed more of, of, of a visualization, of a, of a, again, this is before your time. So sad that you didn't live through that. But literally... I, I'm growing up from uh, in the 60s and 70s, and certainly when I grew up, and certainly in the 60s, where the Cuban Missile Crisis and the and Russia and the Iron Curtain and the Soviet Union, you had this incredible superpower called the Soviet Union, invincible, indomitable, the Iron Curtain. And really, when I grew up, that was the whole concern. We, uh, the World War Three, atomic war, nuclear war. I guess a little bit. Of you, I'm not sure. I mean. I mean, it's really disgusting that uh, the typical kids today are really afraid of nuclear war. I doubt it. But when I grew up, that was the real concern. That we're just going to blow up because everyone's going to just nuke each other and we're going to be able to be gone. And the Soviet Union was, a, it was an unimaginable power. And, and you're just going through life and all of a sudden. And of course, you give Reagan the credit on the surface, but nothing happened to this world without a country's world. Everything is, is divinely ordained. And just to literally be living in a world, growing up with the Soviet Union is, is impossible to destroy. Nobody can think in, a, in any which way you're going to bring them down. And with barely a fire shot. A, a, a gun, not, not a gun, not a bazooka, not a bomb, nothing. Come out. Just one by one. The country's full, one by one. And it's standing and shaking their head, what is going on here? The Soviet Union crumbles. And you're living in the aftermath of that incredible fall, which was unimaginable at the time for, for, for almost a half a century. How does it work? But as far as when he wants to make something happen, our boy said, it is so simple to make happen. As far as has a thousand ways of a little bit of purity, a little bit of spark, a little bit of fire, of truth, of Torah. 
And how amazing is it that Rashi gives a muscle where the, where the blacksmith is holding on to the hammer? Because the message is you have this power in your hand. All you have to do is actually wake up and recognize there it is. It's right for you to look at, right for you to see. It's right here. Don't you need to be distracted. Don't look in any direction. You don't have to make anything else with your hands. Just look at what you have. Right there for you to, to access. Torah. Totally. The place I mentioned must be, must be tough because again, it's, the world's got so many things coming at us. And it's so easy to maybe forget what it is that we need to rely on. And when things get rough, we, we're, we're living in a world where we, we look to our friends. I mean, they, we, you think about Eretz Yisrael, it's so easy for a junior Eretz Yisrael. We need America, we need this, we need that, we need all these. And good friends are always important. But at the end of the day, what was it that gave the, the incredible powers of Eretz of Klai Yisrael the power to beat those Greeks? What did you, the Hamakibi, what did those incredible Jews have, the Kashmiram have, to be able to defeat the enemy? It wasn't their incredible missiles and their incredible guns and their incredible military. It was Akash Baruch who's saying, you're going to win because you are grabbing purity. You're grabbing truth. You're holding on to the greatest weapon in the history of mankind. A weapon that has allowed us to survive for over 2,000 years under unspeakable conditions. Under the most incredible odds. And nobody can explain it. Mark Twain writes an essay, The Mystery of the Jews. Everyone starts getting all excited. Oh, Mark Twain, The Mystery of the Jews. How did the Jews survive? We don't need Mark Twain to tell us that. We have greater people writing. Kai Nafshi or Yaakovenda writes, It's the greatest miracle of all time. The miracle of Jewish survival. It should only happen when we grab. That which is pure, not foolishness and emptiness. So we get a little bit shaken. And somehow we wonder how, how are we going to bring the Shiach? And there, there's so many sorrows, there's so many challenges, and there are. The right side is the answer is right in front of our eyes. Why Yosef? Why is Hanukkah always around this parsha, these parshas? Because Yosef had this incredible connection to his father. Yosef was a common mobile of his father. He grabbed every, every possible second of learning with his father. He was a special, he was a, he, he was a receptacle of Torah from Yaakov Avinu. No matter where he went, he went down to to betray him, and he had it just both from this week, Parsha, harassing him and harassing him. What an incredible Rashi that tells us how in the world you have this woman coming at you every single day, and how do you resist? How do you not cave into the temptation? And Rashi says one of the most powerful forces that kept Yosef from falling into that trap and emerging as Yosef Hatzadik, where I say, think about those words. How many people in our history are called Yosef Hatzadik? Hatzadik. Who has that title? Hatzadik. Very few people. Shimon Hatzadik. Yosef Hatzadik. That's it. Like, what did he do? He resisted. How did he resist? When, it, when things were about to fall apart, he, re he remembered. The most Yukno Shalom, the image of his father, the image of Yaakov Yu came into his mind, into his feelings, into his emotions. And right away he recognized, I can't do this. I cannot, I cannot allow myself to fall into this abyss. I fought so hard to be who I am. I received so much from my father and that power of Torah, and that power of connection, and that power of the relationship with his father kept him strong and allowed him to become Yosef HaTzadik, a man who changed the destiny of Klai Yisrael. But that's who we are. That's what we have. That's why when people say, and I always share almost every year, remember USA Today, so maybe, I don't know, about 25, 30 years ago, wrote, wrote up a, an article about the holiday season. They asked different uh, clergy people, you know, what's the meaning of the holidays to? They asked a Muslim about their holiday and a Christian about their holiday, and that's the truth. 
Jewish rabbi. I don't remember right now if her name was Sharon or Janet, I'm not sure, but the answer, Jewish rabbi, you know, what, what does Hanukkah mean to you? And how sad is that in the USA Today, a national newspaper, somebody called Rabbi answers, Hanukkah is nothing more than eating jelly donuts and latkes and exchanging presents and has no meaning today. How pathetic of an answer is that? But we are living every single day the challenge of Hanukkah. Where Hanukkah, you can argue, is the most relevant you know, in terms of the message that, that it brings to us. And every day we are trying to fight that darkness. We're trying to bring that hammer down on that anvil and bring that light of Torah to the world. But we are desperate to bring Mashiach and we are reminded of what it's going to take. And that's why ultimately, why is it if the battle is so amazing, why do we focus on the night? Why do we focus on the lights? After all, there's so much so much more meaning when it comes to the fact that we survived. We, brought, we got the base of English back. We had access to the base of English. But one of the many answers given is because you don't know what winning the battle means unless you have that purity of oil. When a Kajbarf allowed us to find that one jar of oil that lasted for eight days, that Shemin Zayin is off, Rabbi say, that reminded us of what Torah is about. Shemin Zayin is off, that pure fire, that pure Torah. That commitment that we bring every single day. We drag ourselves in here, sometimes with fetching, sometimes with, with being tired, but you drag yourself in here and you bring that Torah. And you listen to that shir. And you're involved in your davening and you're involved in your learning your voice and you don't realize the power you're bringing to this world. That's who we are. That's what each and every one of us has. And with that power... The Soviet Union could fall, or the Shah in the world could fall in eight seconds. Not even a shot can be fired. That's the way Akash Baruch runs the world. Our job is to take Hanukkah and to not listen to that rabbi, not listen to the USA Today. This Hanukkah is super relevant. The message of Yosef is profoundly relevant. Because we have that power. That's the power that we've been given. If we stop and we reflect it, if this is who we are. This is what we have. This is our destiny. This is our mission. Now's the time to really be focused on that. Next eight days of Hanukkah represent a time of reconnection to that spiritual destiny of Torah and Kedusha. Because it should let's grab onto it. Let's Bang that hammer, let's produce that light and talk to the guests in the chef.